The studies in which we have been currently engaged concern matters that many of those people who know something about them in one form or another regard as mysteries. There are specific reasons why knowledge of these things is withheld from the world on a very broad scale. Since the opinion is held that those particular things that are being considered are aspects of an extensive knowledge of supersensible affairs that should not yet be imparted to humanity today. I consider this view in so far as it pertains to certain matters that are being spoken about here to be mistaken on the grounds that it appears to me to be necessary for mankind to make the courageous resolve to engage in a real study of the supersensible worlds. And the only way of achieving this is that one directly takes hold of what addresses the question under consideration in a specific way. Today I should, first of all, like to deal with a sort of preliminary question. We spoke yesterday about the members of man's being between death and a new birth. A very widespread objection to the discussing of these matters, not on the part of initiates, but from the uninitiated, is that one simply says, well, now, why is it necessary to know anything about such things? It would be better to wait until one has passed through the gate of death, and one will see perfectly well what, is re- what it is really like in the spiritual world. This is something that is often said. Now the fact of the matter is that we can never answer such questions from a hard and fast standpoint, where we are speaking of realities. For in a spiritual scientific context, we always have to respond to them from the standpoint of the times in which we are living. We live in the fifth post-Atlantean epoch, which began in the 15th century AD. It was then, as we know, that the fourth post-Atlantean epoch, which began in the 8th century BC, came to an end. Seven such cultural epochs may be distinguished. One can discern from this that we have passed beyond the middle of the cultural development of the earth, which had its focal point in the fourth post-Atlantean epoch, and that by virtue of this fact, and we are, moreover, in the fifth great period of the earth, we have entered the time in which the earth is in a descending phase of evolution. The studies in which we have been engaged in the course of these days may make you aware that we are dealing with a descending phase of evolution, with a process which is not so much one of evolution as of devolution, an evolution that has a retrogressive aspect. Our entire earthly evolution is in a retrogressive phase. Certain faculties and forces which were present in the previous period of an ascending evolution, have now ceased their activity, and others now have to take their place. This is especially the case with regard to certain of man's inner faculties of soul. One can say that until the fourth post-Atlantean epoch, and roughly until the time of the mystery of Golgotha, human beings still had the faculties that enabled them to have a certain connection with the supersensible world. As we know, these faculties have disappeared in all manner of different ways. They are no longer present as elemental capacities. They have simply ceased to exist. Not only has man's life on earth between birth and death changed with respect to such faculties, but there has even, and more radically, been a change in his life between death and a new birth. With respect to this period, between death and a new birth, it has to be said that in the present cycle of human evolution, which is already in a descending phase, human beings will, on passing through the gate of death, 
need to have specific memories of what they have acquired here in the physical body. If they are to find a right attitude and a right relationship to the events to which they are exposed between death and a new birth. Indeed, one of the necessary prerequisites for a life after death that is as it should be is that human individuals should before death increasingly acquire certain conceptions about the life after death. For only if they remember these ideas which they have acquired here on earth will they be able to orient themselves in the time between death and a new birth. It is objectively untrue to assert that it would be possible to wait until death to concern oneself with such notions about life between death and a new birth. If people continue to cling to these prejudices, if they firmly refuse to try to explore such ideas about life between death and a new birth, this life, this disembodied existence, would become dark and disorienting for them. In the absence of everything that I described to you yesterday, they would be unable to enter in the right way into their spiritual surroundings. Until close to the time of the mystery of Golgotha, it was the case that people brought faculties into physical life which derived from the spiritual world, and this was the source of their atavistic clairvoyance. As you are well aware, the existence of this atavistic clairvoyance arose from the fact that certain spiritual faculties radiated into this life from the prenatal condition. But instead of this, the reverse now needs to happen. Human beings increasingly need to acquire here on the earth some conception of life in the post-mortem state, life after death, in order that they may be able to carry something of what they remember of this through the gate of death. This is what I particularly want to say concerning this preliminary question. Thus the flippant talk of being able to wait until death before acquiring such thoughts is of no account if one clearly bears in mind the period of earthly evolution in which we are living. One must always keep an eye on specific details. For standpoints that are valid in the absolute sense, that are valid for all time, do not exist. There are only perceptions which can give man orientation for a certain period of time. This is a spiritual scientific truth that one simply has to assimilate. And now I should like to embark upon something that can bring our studies to a provisional conclusion. We started out by saying that people today are aware of a gulf between what they refer to as ideals, whether of a moral kind or from a, another source, and ideas on the one hand and what they perceive to be their views about the natural world order. The concepts and views that people have about the natural world order do not permit them to accept that the ideals that they bear within their hearts have any real power or can become realities, as is possible for forces of nature. The important point to be considered here is as follows. We now have an awareness of the way that man's being is ordered here on the physical earth. We also have some knowledge of the organization of man's being in the spiritual world between death and a new birth. Some while ago I posed a question which confronts anyone who takes life seriously in a very real way, but is the precise kind of question that one cannot even remotely address if one is aware of the aforesaid gulf between idealism and realism. The question is, why is it that in our world order 
many people die young, either already as children, or as young people, or in the prime of life, whereas others die when they are old. What connection does this have with the ordering of the world? Neither idealism, on the one hand, nor realism, which is unable to regard ideals as real forces, on the other, can properly address such questions, which are nonetheless vital questions. One can, in fact, approach such questions only if one takes something quite specific into consideration. One needs to bear in mind that man, as he is constituted today, as an earthly human being, relates fairly readily to space, but not with equal facility to time. Modern philosophical viewpoints, as a whole, do not offer any conclusion that is worth mentioning, and the question of the essential nature of time has hitherto been addressed only amongst very limited circles of people. It is, moreover, not so easy to speak in a layman's language about time and its essential nature. But it may perhaps be possible to give you an idea of what I actually mean if I speak of time by making an analogy with space. I will have to make a claim on your patience, because the brief elucidation that I want to make appears to have a somewhat abstract character, although it really is only apparently so. If you simply view a portion of the world of space, you know that what you can see manifests itself to you in accordance with the laws of perspective. You have to take perspective into account if you are viewing a portion of the spatial world. If you now transpose the portion of the spatial world that you are looking at and to which you instinctively ascribe the quality of perspective to a flat surface, you take perspective into account. Thus, when, for instance, you look down an avenue, you see its more distant trees smaller and closer together. You can express this in perspective by bringing what you see in space to expression on a surface in this sort of way. And there's a drawing. It is obviously the case that what you see in space is adjacent on a flat surface. In space the objects are not next to one another. Here you have two trees in the foreground, while two others are in the far distance. But, By bringing the portion of space that is being observed onto a surface, you place objects that are actually behind one another side by side. By contrast, you have the instinctive capacity to translate what you see painted or drawn on a surface into a spatial dimension. The reason why you have this capacity is that man as he is now, as an earthly human being, has to a considerable extent liberated himself from space as such. Man has not freed himself from time in the same way. This is a fact of immense and far-reaching importance, but it is unfortunately hardly noticed, at any rate by science. Because they evolve in time, people think that they have an overview of time, that they know all about time. But as a matter of fact, they do not know about real time. What they experience as time is not real time at all. Its relationship to real time is something that one might call a reflection. What they generally refer to as time is related to real time in the same way that this picture, see the drawing, on a flat surface, is related to space. Generally speaking, people do not experience real time. Rather, do they experience a reflection of time, a mere image of its real nature? This can be very difficult to imagine. It is, for example, extraordinarily difficult to envisage that something that is exerting an influence today 
does not need to belong to the present, but has its real existence in a much earlier period of time and is not a reality in the present. You can see what was present in a very early period working as though in perspective into your own time. What I have just said has a very significant consequence, namely that everything that we call nature has an altogether different character from all that we must regard as being a certain part of man himself. Ahriman, for example, is active in nature, and one can say the same of Ahrimanic forces. But Ahrimanic forces are never an active force in nature in a present context. If you look at nature as a whole, Ahriman is indeed to be found working there. But his activity derives from a far distant time. Ahriman works from the past. And whether you are surveying the mineral, the plant, or the animal kingdom, you should never be saying that Ahriman is active in anything that is spread out before your eyes at the present time. Nevertheless, Ahriman is active in all of this, but from the past. So, if I were to present what I am saying in the form of a diagram, I would have to say, here is the line of evolution from the past to the future, and here you are surveying the natural world. There's diagram two. Yes, you must imagine that you are looking at the world of nature from this point. There is no trace of Aramonic forces in what you are surveying as a present reality. But the influence of Araman is exerted upon nature from the past, from a specific period in the past. When, moreover, you become aware of Araman in nature, he appears to you in a kind of temporal perspective. If you were to say that Araman is active in the present, you would be making the same mistake with regard to nature as if you were to say, when I look at a scene in space, the trees in the far distance are beside those in the foreground, parenthesis, on the grounds that they can be placed in perspective on a flat surface, close parenthesis, see diagram 1. A fundamental requirement for a true perception of the spiritual world is that one learns to see in perspective, in a temporal sense, that one learns to place every being in the point of time where it belongs. When I told you yesterday that the ego after death is in a certain sense transmuted from a condition of mobility into one that is more fixed, that is not all that is to be said on this subject, and something more needs to be added. Let us suppose that you had been living here on earth with your ego from 1850 until 1920, and in 1920 you became aware of your ego. What I mean is this. You will probably have been aware of it before, but now you look back. You look back upon your ego with the spirit self through the hierarchies. And you see that your ego has been at a constant standstill from 1850 until 1920. The ego is present, but it does not progress. This means that your experiences do not accompany you shortly after your death, but instead you look back at them. You look back on them from a perspective that is distant in a temporal sense. And you perceive a sequence of time, just as you perceive spatial distance here in the physical world. I can also express it as follows. If, shall we say, you die in 1920, you go on living with all that I have described to you yesterday as the members of your being. But you look back at the stretch of time when you have been living here on earth with your ego. This stretch of time remains as it is, and you continue to see it where it belongs in the time sequence, inasmuch as you are living with a sense of perspective. 
It is in such a way that you must picture Araman involved in external nature, though from a former point in time. This is very important, and it is something that is barely considered. If one is wanting to understand the world, if one wants to speak about time in a spiritual, scientific way, one must conceive of time in a spatial-like way and take this ongoing connection of reality with time into account. This is very important. Now, what I have said with regard to the Aramanic powers, namely that they work from out of the past, is correct as far as nature is concerned. But the situation with man is different. In the course of man's life, between birth and death, everything that takes place in time becomes maya or illusion for him. While he lives here on earth, he himself lives in the course of time. And by living a certain number of years, he lives through this temporal sequence along with them. As time passes, so does he himself accompany it. This is not the case with space. If you walk down an avenue, the trees remain behind as you move forward, and you do not take the trees that have remained behind, thus also your impressions of them, along with you in such a way that as you take a step you had the idea that your image of the trees is accompanying you. This is what you do in the case of a temporal image. Because you are yourself evolving in time, what you actually do in the physical body is that over time you surrender to an illusion with regard to your perspective. You do not notice the perspective of time and the subconscious part of our human nature is particularly unaware of it. Man's subconsciousness is really blind to this aspect of living with time and has a totally illusory relationship to the perspective of time. This does, however, have a quite specific consequence, which is that aramonic forces are enabled to work within man as forces belonging to the present. Aramonic forces exert an influence upon man's inner life as forces of the present. So this is how man relates to nature. As he looks out upon nature, there is nothing aramonic in the present, but it works in fact as maya, as an illusion. But Man has surrendered himself to this illusion with regard to what I have been explaining to you, with the result that the Aramonic powers gain through man the possibility of creeping into the present, of migrating into our present time. We can say that the Aramonic powers, and the same also applies to the Luciferic powers, although from a somewhat different aspect of which we shall speak shortly, are active in nature in such a way that they do not actually have anything to do with the present, but are extending their influence into it from an earlier period of time. Whereas within man, these aramonic powers are working as a present reality. What is the consequence? The consequence of this is that because of the point that I have just been making, Man is unable to feel any relationship to nature in his deepest inner being. He observes his own being and is aware of his feelings while sensing the working of nature's laws. Because aramonic forces are present day realities within him, whereas in nature they are forces from the past, everything that is in accordance with nature appears to him to be different from what is evolving within his own being. He does not understand the difference that he observes between himself and nature in the right way. Were he to resolve it in the right way, it would be as I have just explained. He would say, 
out there in nature, Araman's influence extends from out of the past. In me, Araman is active as a force belonging to the present. What happens as a result is that while he may not be conscious of the difference, he acts in accordance with it. And he experiences nature as devoid of spirit. He may no doubt feel that the Aramonic forces are not working directly within nature at the present time. But he experiences nature as devoid of spirit because rather than say to himself that Araman is working from out of the past, he sees nature only as it is now and Araman is no longer active there. Now, however strange it may sound, Araman is nonetheless that power which is used by the creative powers of the world to bring nature into being. When one speaks of the spirit of nature, of the true spirit of nature, one should actually be speaking of the spirit of Araman. Here Araman is fully justified. The beings of the normal hierarchies make use of the Aramanic spirit to bring about the nature that is spread everywhere around us. The reason why we do not experience nature as permeated with spirit is that the spirit is not included in the present life of nature, but its influence extends from out of the past. This, I may say, is the secret of the creative powers of the world, that they make use of a spirit whom they have allowed to remain at an earlier stage to exert his influence at a later stage while enabling him to work from out of the past. When we are speaking of nature, we should be speaking neither of matter nor of forces, but rather of aramonic beings. But we should be speaking in such a way that we place these aramonic beings in the past. Thus, a strange thing emerges from this. Imagine some philosopher of nature who is speculating about what lies behind all the phenomena of nature. Well, he forms all kinds of theories and hypotheses about atomic relationships and the like. But this is not the point. Behind what is spread out around us and visible to our senses is not what the philosophers of nature generally suppose to be there. Because behind all this is the totality of Aramonic forces, though not as present realities. If, therefore, the philosopher of nature feels obliged to postulate the existence of atomic structures of some sort behind the chemical elements, he would be mistaken. Behind the chemical elements are aramonic forces. Were you to be able to unveil and look behind what you see of the chemical elements, you would not see anything there at present. Where people look for atoms, it would be hollow. And what is active there is working into this hollow space from out of the past. This is how it is in reality. Hence, these numerous unfortunate theories regarding what the, quote, thing in itself, unquote, is, for this thing in itself is not there at all at present. In the place where people look for the thing in itself, there is nothing. But the influence there derives from the past. So one could say that when Kant was searching for his thing in itself, he should have said, I cannot approach what I am wanting to reach as the thing in itself. This is what he did also say. But he did not realize that he had not found anything at all belonging to the present, and that if he had gone behind the veil of phenomena and had gone far back into the past, he would have found the Aramonic powers. With man himself, the situation is different. Through the very fact that man participates in time as a living being, it has been possible 
for the Aramanic powers to gain entry to our world through the portal of humanity and to work in a corresponding way within man. The consequence of this activity of the Aramanic powers in man is that he disconnects what he sees in the present from the spirit, that he separates his present existence from the spiritual domain. This is the result of the fact that we bear Aramanic forces in the state of Maya within us. Thus one can say that our perception of the world as a material entity bereft of spirit, as a mere natural order whose culmination is thought to be found in the law of the conservation of energy and matter, which is an illusion, that this is what we regard to be the natural order is entirely due to the circumstance that we bear our harmonic forces within us and not that they exist in nature as forces of the present. Our conception of nature as something conceived of in a purely material way does not therefore correspond with nature as such, but only with nature as it is at present. But this present reality of nature is an abstraction, because Araman's influence upon it is always exerted from out of the past. However, not only is an Aramanic influence active within man, but also one emanating from Lucifer. This Luciferic influence has in a certain sense a different tendency in the universe from that of Araman, which we can visualize in the way that we have been describing. Araman's influence within us tends toward a materialistic conception of the world, that we conceive of the world in a materialistic way and think only in terms of a natural order is the result of the Aramanic influence that we bear within us. Whereas our propensity to cherish ideals that are disconnected from the world of nature, ideals in accordance with which we would wish to govern our mutual relationships, but which in the context of our present world conception necessarily have the quality of mere dreams that will vanish into oblivion when the earth has reached the end point determined for it by natural law, is the consequence of the constant striving of the Luciferic forces, which live in us, as do the Aramanic forces, to wrench that part of us that is accessible to them wholly out of the natural order and to spiritualize it in its entirety. The main tendency of the Luciferic forces, insofar as they dwell within us, is to make us as spiritual as possible, to tear us, wherever possible, away from material life of any kind. They therefore lead us to believe in ideals that have no validity in the natural world and are powerless in the present world order. If in the course of future earthly periods man were wholly to succumb to the Luciferic influence so that he believed that ideals are mere intellectual formulations to which feelings must be subordinate, he would be following the powers of Lucifer. The material earth to which we belong would disintegrate, would disappear without trace in the cosmic expanses and would fail to fulfill its purpose and the Luciferic powers would lead man to another spiritual world to which he does not belong. To this end they need to employ the stratagem of leading us to believe in ideals that are actually mere dreams. Just as Araman, on the one hand, deceives us with a world that is nothing but a natural order, so does Lucifer, on the other hand, present us with a world that consists only of fabricated ideals. This is something that is highly significant. 
and at present some kind of adjustment can only be made in those regions that lie in the unconscious areas of man's being. Human beings must, however, become increasingly conscious of these matters, otherwise they will not extricate themselves from this dilemma or succeed in building the necessary bridge between idealism and realism. What creates some kind of adjustment in our time is the following. When at present young people die, for example children, these children, and it is similar with all young people, have only glimpsed at the world. They have not fully lived out their lives on the physical plane. They arrive in the other world, the world between death and a new birth, which unfolds in the way I described yesterday, with a life that has not been fulfilled on the physical plane. By living only a part of their earthly life, they bring something into the spiritual world from the earthly life that one cannot bring when one has become old. One enters the spiritual world differently when one has grown old from if one dies young. If one dies young, one has lived one's life in such a way that one still has many of the forces that one had before birth in the spiritual world. Because of this, one has established an intimate connection between the spiritual forces that one has brought with one and the physical existence that one has experienced here. And through this intimate connection, it is possible to take into the spiritual world something of what has been acquired on the earth. Children and others who have died young take into the spiritual world something from the earthly life that cannot by any means be carried over by someone who dies as an older person. What is carried over in this way is then in the spiritual world. And what children and young people bring with them gives the spiritual world a certain gravity which it would not otherwise have. Thus giving this same spiritual world in which people are living together a quality that prevents the Luciferic powers from completely severing the connection between the spiritual and physical worlds. Just think what a tremendous mystery we are beholding here. When children and young people die, they take something with them from here by means of which they impede the Luciferic powers in their efforts to separate us completely from earthly life. It is of the greatest importance that one keeps this in mind. If one lives longer here on the earth, one cannot upset the calculations of the Luciferic powers in the same way. For, from a certain age, one no longer has that intimate connection between what one brought with one at birth and physical earthly life. Once a person has become old, this inner connection is dissolved, and the exact opposite now occurs. From a certain age onward, we gradually imbue the spiritual aspect of the physical earth with our own being we make the physical earth more spiritual than it would have been otherwise. Thus, from a certain age, we spiritualize the physical earth in a certain way that is imperceptible to the senses. We bring a spiritual quality to the physical earth, just as we endow the spiritual world with a physical quality when we die young. When we grow old, we exude a certain spirituality. I cannot express it in any other way. From a spiritual point of view, growing old consists in a sense of exuding a spiritual quality here on the earth. In this way the calculations of Araman are upset. It is because of this that Araman cannot in the long run have so intense an influence on human beings today that their conviction that ideals have a certain significance can be completely extinguished. Nevertheless, we are at present very close to a situation 
where people will fall prey to the most dreadful errors with regard to these very things. Even well-meaning people will easily succumb to such errors in this particular area. These errors will grow to an ever greater magnitude, and as earthly evolution advances, they may well assume gigantic proportions. To give you an example, there is a really intelligent philosopher called Robert Zimmerman, who in 1882 wrote a book called, titled, Anthroposophy. I have already mentioned this in a certain context. This anthroposophy is not what we now call anthroposophy. It is more or less a tangle of different concepts. But this is because Robert Zimmermann could not see into the spiritual world and was merely a an Herbartian philosopher. Nevertheless, he has written this Anthroposophy. But in this Anthroposophy, Robert Zimmermann concerns himself from his own standpoint with the question that in the course of these days I have placed on the top of our agenda. On the one hand, he sees ideas, logical ideas, aesthetic ideas, ethical ideas, on the other he sees the natural order, and he is completely unable to find a bridge from these logical, aesthetic, and ethical ideas to the natural order, but instead holds firmly to the thought that on the one hand there is the natural world, and on the other the world of ideas. His conclusion is, in fact, extraordinarily interesting, for it is thoroughly typical of someone today. He ends up by saying that it is inherently impossible for man to furnish nature with ideas and to endow ideas with a force of nature. The two worlds can actually only be brought together in people's heads. This is what he says. Hence, in one context, where he is summing up everything that he is saying and thinking he makes the following statement, quote, the realization of ideas belongs neither to the past nor to the present, but is a task whose fulfillment lies in the future and in the hands of human beings, the dream of a golden age, regarding which a sober rationalist like Kant, in the form of his notion of everlasting peace, and an extreme positivist like Comte, in his état positif, would it as such raptures, will be fulfilled when the whole world of ideas becomes real, and the whole of reality is imbued with ideas. That is to say, when what Schiller called the secret art of the master, the extermination of matter through form, is made manifest, or, in the words of Schleiermacher, when ethics have become physics and physics ethics. Close quote. Steiner again. Yes, but this can never be. The only way that this can happen is for human beings to bring ideas to fulfillment in their social organization. But when the earth has come to an end, the whole dream world of ideas will have vanished. No other outcome is possible according to such a philosophy. Hence a philosophy of this nature always remains abstract and must ultimately arrive at the following position. Quote, a philosophy such as this is not, like theosophy, based on a theosophical standpoint, inaccessible to human knowledge, and which considers the dream of reason to be something long since realized, nor does it, like anthropology, rest upon the admittedly anthropocentric, but nevertheless uncritical standpoint of common experience which regards a reality penetrated with ideas as a mere dream of reason. It is at once anthropocentric, that is, it emanates from human experience, and yet also philosophy, because it seeks to reach out beyond experience by way of logical thought. I, therefore, call it anthroposophy. Close quote. Steiner again. So, Anthroposophy is here the admission 
that one can never bridge the gulf between unreal ideas and a reality bereft of ideas. Now, there is in man himself a being of nature, which therefore belongs to the natural order. While having a connection with a spiritual being who can receive spiritual substance. An anthroposophist such as Robert Zimmermann does not deny this. But the way that man is regarded by modern science is such that the riddle cannot be solved by man, by the microcosm. Let us now recall something that we have already mentioned during these days. We said that we must actually divide man into three parts. Not, of course, so simply as with the skeleton, as I have already explained. However, I have also spoken about this in the concluding notes of my book titled The Riddles of the Soul. We can divide man into three parts, the head, the trunk, and the extremities. The latter term encompasses everything that relates internally to the extremities, including the sexual organs. If we divide man's being in such a way, and now turn to something that we already know, that the form or shape of the head is indicative of forces from the previous incarnation, and actually only the middle region of the trunk belongs to the present, then after what I have explained today, you will no longer find it so incredible if I tell you this about the head. The head that a person bears goes back to the previous incarnation, to the past. Forces from the past, aramonic forces, exert their influence upon the head. And what applies to aramonic forces in general is of particular validity for the human head. Everything relating to the form of the human head does not really belong to the present, for the head is a receptive vessel for the forces of the previous incarnation. And the creative powers make use of the aramonic powers in order to form our head, in order to give our head the form that it has. If the creative powers were not to avail themselves of the aramonic spirits to form our head, we would, forgive me, but this is how it is, in addition to having a much softer head, all have the head of an animal. One person who is like a bull in his character would have a bull's head. Another person who has the nature of a lamb would have a lamb's head, and so on. It is due to the influence of the aramonic forces that are made use of by the creative powers to give us our form, that this animal head which we would otherwise have to bear does not actually crown our bodies, as the Egyptians depicted many of their figures. That we are spared from going about looking like these Egyptian figures, parenthesis, which had good reason to look as they did, because such things were also taught in the Egyptian mysteries, albeit from an atavistic standpoint, and are sometimes also taught today. Close parenthesis. And that, moreover, we do not go around as they did in Rosicrucian pictures, where every woman is painted with a lion's head and every man with that of an ox. This was how the Rosicrucians painted human beings. They chose a more average kind of animal, and therefore gave women a lion's head, which for the most part had a greater resemblance to women, while the men were given the head of an ox or bull because of its greater resemblance to them. So when you see Rosicrucian figures of a man and a woman placed next to one another, the woman with her beautiful leonine head and the man with that of a bull, this is perfectly correct. That the metamorphosis, I mean this now in a Goethean sense, is able to take its course, that our head, which in its form has a tendency toward the animal nature, is formed in accordance with its human shape, we owe to the influence of the Aramonic powers. If the gods had not availed themselves of Araman services in forming our bony head, we would be walking around with animal heads. The divine powers also, however, 
make use of the luciferic spirits. If they did not do so, the extremities or our limb system would not be able to undergo a transformation from our present incarnation to the one that follows. For this, the luciferic beings are necessary. We owe it to the luciferic beings that when we die, the present form of our limbs is gradually transformed into the further form that belongs to the next incarnation. In the middle of the path, between death and a new birth, Araman then has to intervene in order to undertake the other task of remolding our head in the appropriate way. Just as we would be going about with animal heads if we did not have Araman to thank for providing us with human ones, our limb nature would not be metamorphosed into its human aspect by the next incarnation, but would instead take on a demonic aspect. We do in any event lose the head that we have now when we die, not merely as material substance, which is united with the earth, but also in terms of its form. And we do indeed bring into our next incarnation what becomes head out of what is carried over from our limb system. But what is thus carried over would become demonic if we did not have the luciferic powers that are connected with us to think that the transformation can take place from a demon of a purely soul-spiritual nature to the human form of the next incarnation. So both Aramonic and luciferic powers must cooperate in order for us to become human beings. And the essentially human aspect cannot be understood without taking into account the help given by both Araman and Lucifer. As regards its future, mankind cannot dispense with really understanding the influences of Araman and Lucifer. The Bible tells us with absolute justice that the God spoken of at the beginning of the biblical story breathed into man the living breath. But the living breath works within the trunk or the middle system of man's being. Thus, insofar as our concern is with those divine beings who work in a normal way, we are dealing only with this middle system. To the extent that we have to do with the human head, we are dealing with an opponent of the powers of Jehovah, and hence also with an adversary of Christ. And, to the extent that our concern is with man's limb system, we are dealing with the luciferic adversary. So, one will only understand man if one conceives of him in these three aspects. In the group that is to stand at the focal point of our building, you therefore have this trinity of aspects, the representative of humanity who is fashioned in such a way that here the forces of breathing of the trunk are given prominence, the activity of the heart, and so forth. This is the central figure. Then there is that figure in which is active everything of a head-like nature, Araman, and that figure in which there works everything connected with the extremities or limbs, Lucifer. One has to divide the being of man in this way, if one is wanting to understand him. For in the individual human being, man as such is united with Araman and Lucifer. At the same time, this is indicative of the fact that everything that is more or less associated with human thinking, which is, of course, with respect to its physical context bound up with the head, parenthesis, human thinking is enacted on the basis of perceptions, as a process associated with the outward senses, close parenthesis, has an aramonic character. We perceive nature mainly through the senses of the head, and we form for ourselves a picture of nature with the aramonic character just described, because we ourselves bear the aramonic principle in the way that our head has been formed. Ideals, on the other hand, 
from the inner psychological standpoint, I shall return to this on a subsequent occasion, have a great deal to do with love, with everything that belongs to the extremities or the limb system. Because of this, the Luciferic power has a ready access to ideals. Araman takes hold of us through our head, Lucifer through our extremities. It is through our head that Araman deludes us into conceiving of nature as devoid of spirit, while through our limbs Lucifer misleads us into conceiving of ideals that lack any connection with the forces of the natural world. The task of man today is to arrive at a true overview by seeing such things as a whole. You will then see that there is in us a certain barrier that divides us, and that this barrier is in the middle of our trunk, thus separating the head forces, which are aramonic in nature, from the luciferic forces, which belong to the limb system. If, through a mystical insight into our own being, we were able to look right through ourselves, we would indeed understand the natural order by means of our head. But we would also gain insight into ourselves by means of the natural order. And if the Luciferic powers in us were to have things their own way, they would also enlighten us about the Aramonic powers, and we would in this way arrive at a connection between the natural order and the domain of spirit. But there is a particular reason why we cannot do this, and this is that we have a memory. Everything that we receive from nature by way of ideas, concepts, and impressions, we store up in our memory. And if this here, see diagram 4, is a diagrammatic representation of the head region, if this represents the chest region and trunk, and this the extremities or limbs, it is the dividing wall in the trunk region that leads to what we take in of the natural order by way of our head to return to us as the substance of memory. This is why we do not reach down in our perception to where the luciferic influence is active and why we do not observe the aramonic influence just as we do not see what is behind a mirror but only what is being reflected. Here the natural order is reflected in what separates the aramonic from the luciferic in us and is at the same time the basis for our memory for the power of recollection that is thereby being formed. If we were unable to remember the things that we have experienced, if this dividing wall were not there, if, in looking into ourselves, we were to see right through, we would look right down to the Luciferic influence in us, and we would also perceive the Aramonic influence. But now consider for a moment. What we are shown in this mirror is precisely that which we live through in the course of life. And it is this that we look back upon after death. It is from out of this that a mobile or fluid ego becomes one that is firmly fixed. This is what we look back upon. This is what accompanies our life and Araman and Lucifer work along with us, and in such a way that Araman enables us to bear a human head, and Lucifer enables us to avoid becoming a demon, thus giving us the possibility of attaining a further incarnation. I have been somewhat trying your patience with matters that are perhaps rather more difficult to understand, but I wanted to evoke at least a sense for the actual reason why the gulf between idealism and realism has arisen. It has arisen through the fact that Lucifer inspires us with idealism that is powerless in nature, and that Araman calls forth within us a picture of the natural order, which appears to us as entirely devoid of spirit. 
So, the idealists, the abstract idealists, are under a Luciferic influence, and materialists are under an Aramonic influence. It is necessary that one should concern oneself with such things, that instead of adhering rigidly to a system in the name of theosophy, one considers these matters in greater detail. For it is necessary that man becomes aware that he needs to put some energy into ensuring that he will be able to remain united with the Spirit for the rest of earthly evolution. This is an uncomfortable truth. One might even say a hateful truth. Hateful, because it runs counter to so much that people like, that they like because it suits them to do so. There could be no greater challenge for people today than to be told that if they want to retain their connection with the Spirit, they need to do something about it. Most people would prefer the mystery of Golgotha to have occurred in order that they should not have to do anything about their situation, that their sins have been redeemed by Christ, and they can go to heaven without any effort of their own. This is why most theologians are so incensed by anthroposophy, because, of course, from an anthroposophical standpoint, it will never be acknowledged that there is nothing that man has to do in order to maintain his connection with the Spirit, that in the future of earthly evolution this will simply proceed without any contribution on his part. The connection between the physical and the spiritual domains, between the members of man's being as they are between birth and death, and between death and a new birth, is one that will be put into question in the course of future earthly evolution, and it will only avoid entering into a state of disorder if human beings are really able to concern themselves with the spirit, with the future in mind. There is spiritual scientific evidence for this today. This evidence contains highly uncomfortable truths, but they shed light on matters that are of the greatest importance and significance. The connection between man's soul and spirit and his physical and etheric nature in the present has, I would say, already become very loose and people today need to be increasingly awake lest something happens with respect to the connection between their physical and etheric bodies and the soul-spiritual aspects of their being that could lead to these latter aspects being, as it were, sucked out of them. For if prejudices such as that there is no need during life to know anything about how things will be after one's death, become more and more pronounced? Or, if the gulf between so-called idealism and the purely natural order becomes ever wider, there is the danger of an increasing possibility of losing one's soul. There is today still a safeguard against this happening, in that when young people die, the spiritual world is endowed with a certain gravity, and Lucifer's calculations are upset. And when old people die, so much spirituality is exuded into the physical world that Araman's calculations are put into disarray. But one should not forget that as human beings renounce their connection with the spiritual domain, the Aramonic and Luciferic powers will become ever mightier, and that gradually, as the earth descends ever further into a state of devolution, this wall of defense will no longer be able to be fully effective. What I should like to see is that a sort of basic theme should result from our studies in the form of a feeling and feelings are always the most important aspect of what can arise from spiritual scientific activity, for the need to give proper attention to spiritual matters from the present cycle of earth evolution onward. I have emphasized from a variety of different viewpoints 
that from our present time onward human beings need to focus their attention on spiritual concerns. And the only way in which this can be achieved in times to come is that people really make the effort to understand and assimilate, as opposed to resist, even such difficult matters as we have been preoccupied with in the course of these days, and especially today. There needs to be an understanding for the perspectivity of time. When people have arrived at an understanding of the perspectivity of time, they will no longer say, here is idealism, but it is only a dream which has no power to influence the natural world. And on the other hand is the natural order. But they will have come to recognize that the ideals that live within us are seeds for the future, and the natural order is the fruit of the past. This sentence expresses a golden rule. Every ideal is a seed for a future event in nature. Every natural event is the fruit of a spiritual event in the past. Only by means of this rule can one find the bridge between idealism and realism. But something else is necessary if this is to happen. No ideal has ever existed or could ever be the seed for a future event in nature if this future event were to be prevented by what is happening in the natural world now. We can look at some such hypothesis. Let us consider the possibility, which indeed applies today, that through the so-called law of entropy, earthly evolution enters into a state of general warming and that all other natural forces cease. In such an ultimate state, such as this, all ideals would, of course, fade into oblivion. Such an ultimate state is a natural consequence of the supposition that present physical conditions will continue purely in accordance with the law of causality. If one thinks on the lines of present-day physics, that according to the law of the conservation of energy and matter, such an ultimate state will indeed arise, there is no place for an ideal to be absorbed into a natural event in the future, for any future event will simply be the consequence of a present event in nature. But this is not the case. Things are not what they appear to be according to the present conception of nature, but can be viewed quite differently. Everything existing today as matter and energy will at a certain point in the future no longer be there. There is no such thing as a law of conservation of matter and energy. Where one seeks matter, there is nothing other than the influence of a previous aramonic activity. And what surrounds us by way of the sense-perceptible world will, after a certain time, no longer exist. And if everything that is now of, of a physical nature is no longer there, if everything has been completely dissolved, the time will have come when present ideals in the form of natural occurrences will have been added to what is now being destroyed. This is how it is in the wider universe. The situation for the human individual is that he will incarnate again in the next period of cosmic evolution when the conditions in which he has lived during the present incarnation have, to some extent, been overcome. Thus, when an environment can be created for him that is different from the present one, when all that binds him now to the earth has disappeared from the present environment, when everything has changed in such a way that he can experience something new, this is when he will reincarnate. The present ideals that can be formed in man will be nature once everything that is nature at present no longer exists and something new has arisen. But the new that arises is none other than the spirit that has become nature. We must find the bridge over the abyss 
behind the natural phenomena and the ideals. This is what we need to discover. We can reach it today if we do not shrink from developing our concepts so forcefully that they are themselves able to become realities. Thus the need in our modern times is to enter fully into everything that can be learned of a spiritual nature. But allow me to add that it will be most important for there to be an ever greater degree of open-mindedness with regard to spiritual matters. The day before yesterday, I referred to what is hindering the growth of spiritual science, specifically from within the Anthroposophical Society. Above all else, a genuine open-mindedness needs ever and again to be cultivated in this realm. Time and again we experience that the disintegrative tendency that brought about materialism and led to the destruction of the old spirituality has also, by way of human thinking, pervaded the spiritual domain and specifically where spiritual aims are being pursued. I have already drawn attention to how materialistic a lot of theosophical conceptions can be. It is, of course, not easy, when one is discussing matters of a spiritual scientific nature, to find the right words, because our language today is no longer suited to spiritual concepts, and because we must, once again, seek a connection between language and what we want to convey that is appropriate for spiritual things. But it is necessary that we avoid damaging the anthroposophical movement by what is so especially harmful. We need to characterize matters of a spiritual nature in an open-minded way. Again and again I find myself being asked about people who, it is said, are having spiritual experiences. The essence of the questions that are frequently asked is, should one blindly accept the truth of what this or that person sees? If one responds affirmatively to the question, this gives rise to blind devotion. If one replies in the negative, what happens is that the person in question is immediately branded as a heretic and is told that his clairvoyance is atavistic and is therefore of no account. Well, this either-or way of dealing with these matters must really be transformed. We must approach statements about spiritual phenomena with a thoroughly healthy intelligence. But if we want to be dogmatic, we cannot be spiritual scientists. If we either idolize people or condemn them for heresy, we cannot become spiritual scientists. There will be infinite numbers of worthy contributions toward characterizing the spiritual world from quarters that one might not regard as absolutely reliable. It may also happen that people start singing the praises of an individual with clairvoyant faculties. It may then transpire that this person has been glossing over a few things, or even maybe quite a lot, and this individual is then strongly repudiated. The same people who formerly idolized him now reject him altogether. Well, one cannot make any progress as human beings in this fashion. No progress is possible with this either-or of adulating people or condemning them for heresy, but only by approaching things with one's healthy human understanding. It may, for example, also happen that something wholly true, important and essential emerges from the spiritual world through someone whom one knows to be perfectly capable of telling outrageous lies. One would not arrive at this either-or situation to which I am referring if, instead of introducing dogmatic ideas, one endeavored to work within this anthroposophical movement with one's healthy powers of reason. That is the one thing. The other is this, that because of the way that things are frequently dealt with in our circles, it is extraordinarily difficult for the Anthroposophical Society to find its place in the cultural life of the present time. If this is to happen, a certain discernment is required 
from those people who are involved with the society, and those who are involved in it have a growing obligation to exercise such powers of discrimination. For the anthroposophical society will have completely lost its way if we do not try to form a connection with the wider cultural movements of our time, if we again and again fall into the error of practicing sectarianism. It will be the death of our movement if we become sectarian. You need only think that the kind of things that we have been discussing in the course of these days would not be considered particularly strange by someone who is in the midst of the scientific and cultural life of the present time, provided that he were to approach them in a sufficiently unprejudiced way. But in order to accomplish anything of this sort, the will to discriminate needs to be present. It easily happens that the question as to whether someone or other should be allowed to listen to anthroposophical lectures or be given one of the cycles to read is asked in a somewhat theoretical way, without taking into account the level of education or general circumstances of the person concerned. This theoretical approach does us a great deal of harm. It is responsible for the fact that a person, such as the one in Holland, around whom all manner of mischief has been crystallizing, is able to drift into the anthroposophical society and find there people who protect him, whereas others who possess good judgment are often repelled by such conduct. I shall now give you a specific instance. Some time ago, Herr von Vernus joined the Anthroposophical Society with the clear intention, the evaluation of which is open to anyone with a healthy human intelligence, of building a bridge between the wider cultural environment, the literary and scientific life of the present, and our anthroposophical life. Now, Herr von Bernus has, for example, in his own way, recast a number of things that I have said both in my books and in my lectures, in his own poetic style, and publish the result. He has himself shown me the pile of letters of complaint that he has received for having made what was for once a timely effort to carry out his intention. One can hardly be surprised if someone for whom I dare say much is at stake could well be repelled by such behavior to which he was subjected then by the Anthroposophical Society. Nevertheless, the journal that he founded will be of immense service to the Anthroposophical Movement. He also enabled the Anthroposophical Movement in Munich to be represented in his art gallery. But one could observe a certain resistance to something that was both justified and possible. If one considers von Bernus's experiences as a whole, one has a true picture of what both the anthroposophical movement and the anthroposophical society need to learn in order to be a real society. To the extent that the building in Dornach has come into being, it is a society. But much else has not been achieved, which plainly shows that the Anthroposophical Society does not regard itself as a society, but as a collection of separate little sectarian circles. We must really emerge from this stage of sectarianism, but we shall not be able to do so unless we give some serious thought to what we are trying to achieve. It is so very difficult to say such things, and indeed one says them with great reluctance, but there is nevertheless much that is necessary for me to say because I am personally so strongly involved with this anthroposophical movement of ours. If the anthroposophical society is increasingly developing toward the point where it is becoming a society with the explicit tendency of reducing me to silence, a tendency that is actually growing and one that has always existed, it is not a matter of personal vanity if I emphasize this. I am most reluctant to have to say this. 
but the tendency toward reducing me to silence is one that is becoming a common feature in the anthroposophical society. And so the personal element is interconnected with our practical concerns. Because the society has not been behaving as a society should, what has been rising to the surface like poisonous scum are the derogatory comments that lapsed members have been putting out into the world. These are indeed matters that I sometimes have to point out and which cannot remain unspoken. I have alluded to them in places where I have been able to speak recently because I firmly believe that in these tragic times much depends on anthroposophy being presented to the world in the right way. But it is so difficult to bring about some deeper reflection regarding the question. What can be done within the domain of anthroposophy to enable the anthroposophical society to become a real society? Initial efforts are indeed being made by certain individuals, but generally speaking, nothing gets beyond these early beginnings. But now that I have drawn attention once more to these matters, I would hope that some further thought can be given to them. I say this not for personal reasons, but out of the necessities of the times. Just as from what I have presented in the course of these days, you will be able to derive some fruitful ideas which can help you to understand the catastrophic times in which we are living. Bracket words are written on the blackboard, close bracket. Uh, this is 2 September 1918, and they are, Every ideal is a seed for a future event in nature. Every natural event is the fruit of a spiritual event in the past. <laughs>